without further ado then, what I'd like to do is introduce our keynote speaker. Um, so Dr. Tom Lee paid his way through MIT by working at places like Frank Kent's TV and radio service and Hughes Aircraft. His 1989 doctoral thesis at MIT described the world's first CMOS radio. He has been one of the He's been on the faculty of Stanford University since 1994, having previously worked at analog devices and RAM bus. He's helped design phase lock loops for a variety of microprocessors, notably AMD's K6 and K8 and DEX Strongarm. Uh, and he has founded or co-founded a number of companies, including 3D memory company Matrix Semiconductor, which was acquired by SanDisk, and IoT companies, Zero G Wireless, acquired by Microchip, and Ayla Networks. He's an IEEE and Packard Foundation Fellow, won the Best Paper Award at CICC, and three at ISSCC. He's also the 2011 recipient of the Ho Am Prize in Engineering, which is informally known as the Korean Nobel Prize. He is a past director of DARPA Microsystems Technology Office and owns between 100 and 200 oscilloscopes. When I read that, I, I had to say, wow, I have two, you know. Do you want to buy them? <laughs> he also owns thousands of vacuum tubes and kilograms of obsolete semiconductors, and no one, including himself, quite knows why. <laughs> now, I will tell you that I, I listened to Dr. Lee to speak at DesignCon about two months ago here, and I, I told him that it was one of the most enjoyable and informative talks I've ever heard in my life. So I think you will really enjoy this, and I, I want to welcome Dr. Lee. Thanks. Well, as they say in the investing business, uh, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. So uh, I make no guarantees other than I will finish the talk. So. Uh, this talk's titled The Carrington Event, H-Bombs, Telstar and the Great Geomagnetic Storm of 1989 for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, many of my students have never heard of most of these things. If I mention the Great Geomagnetic Storm of 1989, they say, why 1989? We don't even know of any such thing as a geomagnetic storm, and why should we care as double E's? Well, I think this community is the right community to talk to uh, about these kinds of things. And so if you already know this, great. Go back and you know, update your Facebook status. For those of you who might not know all of these things, it might be uh, kind of fun just to take a look at what's been happening the last 150 or so years. So first, you know, three cheers for you all. You know, turn to your neighbor and just congratulate him or her on being a double E because we have created modern civilization. So you know, hooray. You, you are the heroes of the modern age. Absolutely. Engineering is really where art and science converge to make civilization. So that's what engineers do every day. This is the miracle that has powered that miracle, uh, one miracle powering another. Moore's Law, an exponential thing. You've seen this so many times, it probably doesn't affect you anymore. I know that's the case with my students. They look at this and they just go, yawn, been there, done that, seen it before. But when I say, well, you know, forget about the vertical axis being transistors. Pretend that that was actually your bank balance. If it did that over time, you'd be very happy. And they go, oh, well, yeah, maybe that's true. OK, well, maybe this transistor thing's not so bad after all. Um, some stats, just to remind us of what we've achieved collectively as a, a profession. There are now, this year, is an important crossover year. It's when the number of mobile subscriptions actually will exceed the number of humans on Earth. And some people have more than one phone. So that's pretty amazing, 7.3 billion. Uh, only a couple of decades ago, there were no phones, uh, no mobile phones, and now almost everyone has one. You know, the only market that remains untouched really is babies. And I'm sure there are MBAs working really hard to figure out how to tap that last uh, ooch left. Uh, there are actually five times as many non-humans connected to the internet as there are people. That's very interesting to me, and that trend is a, almost a vertical slope right now. Uh, crazy engineers, maybe that's redundant, uh, are talking about a trillion things connected to the internet within 20 years. And so we're about to take this up another couple of notches here, where if you think already you're surrounded by a cacophony of electronics, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. So civilization is about to, again, change in a qualitative way thanks to this incremental, sustained quantitative advance that we've been able to uh, keep up for so long. This is really quite amazing. But with that comes some... Uh, interesting and perhaps insufficiently acknowledged uh, vulnerabilities that we should probably think about. Now at this point, usually my students are snoozing. Uh, so I have to 
hit them with one more factoid. There are 10 to the 17th ants on the planet. And uh, that's according to a guy named E.O. Wilson, and I'm not gonna argue with someone who's bothered to figure that out. So we'll accept that figure as correct. Each year, in aggregate, our fabs are pumping out 100 transistors per ant, and that number is still growing exponentially. So we're outproducing ants, that's amazing. I'm a little worried about what the ants are gonna do with all the capability, but you know, that's for the other people to figure out. Four million cell phones are sold every day, and we use these miracles of modern technology to exchange a quarter million largely content-free text messages per second. Hooray, <laughs> yay engineers. And we keep on going, you know, and so you know, how did this happen? And should we be concerned about you know, the velocity with which these things have happened? Does that mean that we've sort of not been paying attention uh, to all the signposts along the road? So let's go back in time, you know, get in the Wayback Machine, and take a look at telegraphy, you know, the first sort of network uh, that humans really enjoyed. Uh, the first commercial telegraph was in 1838, and that was not Samuel F.B. Morse's, but there was this Wheatstone and Cook's in the UK. They managed to uh, network a 13-mile stretch of the Great Western Railway, and uh, within a few years, Morse did his thing with the famous Baltimore to Washington run in 1844, and less than 20 years later, we had transcontinental coverage in the United States, and that put the Pony Express out of business. So sad for the ponies, and good for the rest of us. Uh, within a few years after that, uh, we were connecting the US and England through a transatlantic uh, cable. So by 1866, the United States was connected basically with the rest of Europe, and a few years after that, with the rest of the world. So we had globally wired up the planet uh, shortly after the turn of the 20th century. So you say, okay, great, well, why is that relevant? Well, it's relevant because with all these wires, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of wiring, we had now deployed inadvertently a very, very large antenna. And the antenna started to sense various things that we hadn't suspected were out there. In 1847, this is only three years after Morse connects Baltimore and Washington, D.C., a guy named W.H. Barlow is puzzled that sometimes there are signals when there's no one transmitting and he starts graphing things just to see what's going on. And if you notice at the bottom, uh, we have a bunch of fluctuations here, and the horizontal axis is denominated in days, and it's covering about two weeks worth of data. What's interesting about this is uh, clear only if you understand something about the magnitudes here. These are just deflections of a galvanometer, which were then used to detect dots and dashes, to deflect a galvanometer needle this much was equivalent to having someone on the other end of the line actually transmitting signals. So he was very puzzled as to why these signals <laughs> existed at all. And he noticed that there was a variation in time. Over the two-week period that he was taking data, it went from big to small again. But there was always this residual background. So he dove in a little bit more carefully and took some more data, zooming in on just one 24-hour period. And he noticed, surprisingly, that uh, two different stations had very similar kinds of variation. And so over a 24-hour period, we see this thing uh, starts off low, gets big, and then 24 hours later, it's back to low again. So it has a diurnal variation, which is very suggestive. But at that time, they didn't understand how the sun worked. They didn't know how the atmosphere worked. And so this was just a mystery. And they just referred to celestial currents. You know, they just came from outer space. Uh, and so uh, this caused a signal-to-noise ratio problem uh, under certain conditions. Now, Barlow thought about, you know, what could possibly cause this, and he rejected many hypotheses. You know, maybe there were magnets nearby that someone was playing with and various other kinds of things, but none of these things really held up uh, under closer scrutiny. He did notice, however, that whenever there were auroras visible, these currents were particularly strong. And now we know this happened to coincide with a uh, solar cycle maximum. So that's very interesting. And uh, major disruptions of telegraph lines throughout Europe, not just in the UK, but throughout Europe, were observed, again, when the auroral displays were uh, particularly prominent. So you know, were these just coincidences, or is there actually causation? And we have to be very careful, because you know, correlation and causality are not the same thing. And there's a famous graph that sort of warns us about that. Uh, in red is global temperature, and in blue is the number of pirates. And you notice there's a very strong correlation. It's an anti-correlation, but uh, as the number of pirates has dropped, uh, global warming has taken off. 
And so one might uh, inadvertently conclude that all, all, you know, to reverse the uh, global warming trends, we just need to make sure we recruit more pirates. Uh, I, I somehow am plagued with doubt, but uh, uh, again, if one thinks correlation and causality are the same thing, we might be led to that false conclusion. So we need to be a little bit more careful and take more data until we can tease out exactly what cause and effect are. Well, about uh, 12 years later, uh, an, a an amateur astronomer, Richard Carrington, he must have been a fun guy at parties because he spent all his time looking at the sun. <laughs> and I I'm sure he had very interesting dinner conversations. Well, today I looked at the sun, it was very bright. And it continued to be bright the entire time I looked at it. Uh, so, uh, you know, he was alone, I'm sure. He never reproduced. So Richard Carrington, uh, drew things like this in his notebook, and on September 1st, 1859, he noticed something that he had never seen before. He saw gigantic dark spots, and he saw them gl uh, growing uh, to cover a substantial fraction of the, the, the part that he was looking at. And in fact, that corresponded to a diameter that was probably about 15 Earth diameters. So we're talking a pretty large uh, display here. And while he was examining this thing over a period of several days, suddenly he happened to be glancing at his apparatus just as a gigantic white flash is emitted from that very area. So he just witnessed in real time a solar flare and the ejection of massive quantities of uh, the sun's corona. So this is quite exciting. He's, he, he can't contain himself. He tells everyone who cared to listen and many who didn't uh, about this phenomenon that he had uh, seen. Now, it lasted five whole minutes, which is forever. Uh, that's a lot of matter being ejected over that five minute period. Well, roughly a half a day or a day later, magnetometers uh, across the world are starting to fluctuate, sometimes with large amplitudes and quite wildly. Compasses start to go wrong, uh, oftentimes by amounts like 10 degrees wrong, which of course made the Brits very nervous because they had you know, navies. <laughs> And they were counting on the navies to maintain their power. And if the navies got lost and fell off the earth, that was bad. So the drift in compasses was extremely worrisome, and especially since they didn't know the cause. Auroras are seen in Rome, and I love this, Hawaii. How often do Hawaiians get to see the aurora borealis? Never. Uh, so something was definitely up. Something was sending huge amounts of charged uh, particles into the atmosphere so that you could actually see glowing plasmas as far south as Hawaii. Uh, more uh, ominously, telegraphers uh, around the world were reporting that their uh, equipment was operating when, uh, even when they disconnected the batteries. Uh, the Boston-Portland circuit actually ran for many hours without batteries. In fact, they had to remove the batteries because there was arcing, and they were worried about the batteries being killed by the arcs. So these were all very mysterious phenomena. They had no idea what was going on, uh, and they just hoped that it would end soon. Well, what was going on was the sun belches things out like this. And this is a, uh, a recent NASA photograph. This is actually from a uh, coronal mass ejection that was caught on film uh, just two years ago. And uh, you, you look at this gigantic loop of matter. This loop will break and just spew forth massive quantities of matter out in the sun at relativistic speeds, You know, a couple of percent the speed of light. For matter, that's, that's booking along at a pretty good clip. Uh, just to make sure we're calibrated, that's roughly the size of the Earth. So just the dimensions, the scale of what the sun does is awesome. It's very difficult for us actually to get uh, comprehension of what is going on here, because it is something we don't experience. We never experience multiple uh, Earth diameter events, at least I hope not. So here's a, a quick clip just showing us uh, what this looks like. Thank you, Microsoft, for warning me about viruses. And it's always so friendly. And what I love about the modern era is that we have satellites that are now able to take pictures like this. So you'll see that just belched out. The Earth is out here somewhere. The sheer volume of material that comes out is awesome. There it is. And so that was probably a small percentage of the coronal mass ejection that happened in 1859. So we're talking something that um, we haven't experienced in recent years, thank goodness. But the fact that it happened within historic memory sort of suggests that uh, if we're odds makers, uh, we need to worry about the probability of this occurring uh, perhaps in our lifetimes. The Carrington event produced brilliant, beautiful auroral displays at latitudes that never, ever saw the aurora. It even inspired this famous, photo, uh, this famous painting by a guy named Frederick Church. If you go to the Smithsonian, 
this picture is hanging there. Uh, and uh, it's assumed, although we're not sure if he ever actually noted this anywhere, but it's assumed that uh, the Carrington event inspired him uh, to paint this. He lived in the Northeast, and that's where a lot of the action was, uh, was happening in the United States. So uh, the Carrington event was really of such a massive scale, telegraphers reported shocks and near electrocutions from their apparatus. If they put their faces too close to the sending key, sometimes they would feel a spark. Uh, at least one telegrapher claimed that he was knocked senseless by the spark. Um, sparks jumped across the terminals and occasionally set fire to the paper tape recording apparatus. Paper, fire, not good. Um, and even when they disconnected the batteries, as I say, these, uh, these machines would operate for a long time and they had trouble with many spurious messages being sent uh, by these celestial currents. No one was actually tapping out the keys, but they were getting signals nonetheless. So that's a pretty major thing. Now, there are wonderful recordings of magnetometer readings uh, that exist today. This is an, an actual one from the time. Uh, it's held in the archives of the British Geological Society. And on the bottom here are compass deflections. And so it should be flat, but we're seeing that there's some nice variation over the period of a couple of days. And over here is, I believe, a measurement of magnetic field strength in the horizontal direction. So this is declination, and that's the horizontal direction. Uh, there's some very interesting things that can be discerned here in retrospect. It turns out that this initial variation here is attributed to x-rays, which, of course, are photons. So they get here really fast. They get here within eight minutes of the coronal mass ejection or whatever phenomenon occurring inside the sun is caused in the CME. Uh, many, many hours later, uh, charged particles, massive ones, actually arrive, and that causes uh, that secondary spike there. So it turns out that modern solar physicists looked at, looking at this data are able to figure out that, in fact, it was a coronal mass ejection because uh, modern ones always have the signature uh, double hook kind of thing. They call it the crochet. So that seems to be uh, pretty much dispositive of the diagnosis that this was a coronal mass ejection. So the sun belches out violently large quantities of uh, charged matter at, at high velocities. The 11-year solar cycle coincides nicely with the historical uh, obs observations of EM disruptions. Uh, in May of 1921, another particularly strong event uh, caused havoc. It even shut down a good fraction of New York City's subway system. But that's pretty amazing. Uh, beautiful auroras are again visible all over the Earth, including as far south as Pasadena, California. Uh, how many Southern Californians have ever seen the aurora? <laughs> well, <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and allegedly a, a telephone station in Sweden at least burned out and possibly burned down. My Swedish is not very good, so I couldn't tell the prepositions there, but something bad happened there. So, uh, and this is all attributed not to smokers, but to a, a, a solar event. So the sun has this 11-year cycle. And we've noticed that bad things happen over periods of sort of 11 or 12 year uh, periodicity. Uh, another significant storm hit in 1960. It had some bad effects. Um, luckily, the impact of these storms so far, at least as far as the slide set is concerned, it's limited by not the storms themselves, but by the relatively primitive level of technology and the sparse deployment of that primitive technology that existed at these historic times. So even at 1960, you know, it's pre-ICs. ICs are, you know, were just recently a gleam in the eyes of Jack Kilby and, and Bob Noyce. They certainly had, didn't have any impact uh, on, techno on, on civilization yet. Uh, the first transatlantic telephone cable, TAT-1, um, suffered extended outages in that 1960 event. Uh, Bell Labs engineers were uh, astonished to discover 500 volt spikes on the submarine cable. And it was powered by vacuum tubes. Transistors were not yet deemed sufficiently reliable to trust a couple of miles underneath the ocean. So they had vacuum tubes in the cable as repeaters. And vacuum tubes are pretty hardy things. It takes a lot to kill a vacuum tube. Well, they were stunned into paralysis by these 500 volt spikes. And the Bell Labs folks were really worried that it was actually gonna kill the repeaters along that uh, cable and was gonna knock out our one uh, telephone link um, in the ocean. So that, that was pretty amazing in 1960. If you imagine that level of interference occurring today, where we've got GPS, we have delicate cell phones, we have cell towers, we have everything else that we depend on and don't even think about how much we depend on these things, if they're suddenly taken away, 
uh, you'd notice it. So we really have to worry about these kinds of events happening today and happening 10 years from now and 20 years from now when we've done even more as engineers to successfully uh, insinuate this technology into every corner of our lives. Now, as bad as those events were, they could have been a lot worse. We're very privileged to live on a planet that's got a magnetic field, a good enough one that uh, most of the energetic particles here, which thankfully are protons and electrons, they're charged, and so uh, the magnetosphere deflects most of these uh, particles away from life, which is why life has been able to evolve here. And um, the charged particles have to go somewhere, and so they're actually confined in a couple of toruses around the Earth in something that now is known as the Van Allen belt, and it looks roughly like this if you clean up the diagram a lot. And the Van Allen belt is very interesting because of the fact that it is sort of the garbage can for the uh, uh, high energy electrons and protons that the sun belches out, but also because of the role it plays in sort of the next phase of our story. Now, James Van Allen is much lauded because uh, you might remember that Sputnik was launched in October of 1957, and it just threw the United States into a tizzy of fear. We started to imagine the Soviets having the heavy launch capability to hurl atom bombs down at us from above, like throwing rocks from a highway overpass, as uh, Lyndon Johnson were worried about. And uh, so sort of as a PR response to that, the US said, well, you know, Sputnik didn't do anything except show that they had big rockets, and, and Sputnik only beeped. It didn't do anything scientific. It, it simply beeped. And in fact, uh, we were so surprised that all it did was beep that we were certain that the beeping actually had hidden in it encoded modulations that were you know, spying on the Earth as it passed over. And so at least one three-letter agency that I'm aware of spent a good fraction of taxpayer dollars doing advanced signal processing on the beeps to tease out what they were certain were hidden messages in there. The conclusion after about a year of deep mathematics was, no, they're just beeps. So uh, Explorer 1 gets launched with actual instrumentation on board. It has a Geiger counter on it just to see if there's radiation out in space, and if so, how much. And that's when Van Allen discovers that we're surrounded by radiation, that it's really hostile up there. Space is not a place you want to hang out uh, too long, because you're getting lots of chest x-rays per day. So uh, there he is in the center holding up a model of Explorer 1, the satellite that carried this instrumentation package. And it was the first scientific discovery made with satellites, artificial satellites. So that's great. Now, interestingly, Van Allen was not just a pure theoretician. He was not just a pure scientist happy to discover the Van Allen belt and, and go on with it. Uh, this was the Cold War. Lots of out-of-the-box thinking. Sometimes you're so far away from the box, you can't even see the box. And this is one of those cases. So the same day that Van Allen discovers that we're surrounded by this radiation belt, immediately a discussion ensues with the five-sided building you know, occupants that uh, there might be a threat here. Suppose the other side is able to control the radiation belt, modulate its position, and maybe deliver uh, lethal radiation to points in, in North America. And then by gosh, the next step in your thinking is if they could do it, then we should be able to do it too. And so we ought to have a crash program to learn how to control the Van Allen belt before anyone else does. So holy cow, we go from, hey, here's this great, interesting scientific discovery to how can we weaponize it. And so I love what happens. That conversation then leads to a funded plan, secret funded plan, to see if we can use nukes to reposition the Van Allen belt at will. And, and we're off to the races. So scientists are sharpening their pencils and getting out all their uh, advanced slide rules to think about how we can take nukes and use them to change the Van Allen belt. Uh, I, I love this thing. So the only thing kind of holds them up for a while is that there's a moratorium, a sort of a voluntary one between the Soviets and the United States not to do atmospheric nuclear tests. That moratorium holds until uh, the fall of 1961 when the Soviets decide they've had enough of this waiting around and they just decide to start doing more tests above ground. So JFK responds by authorizing resumption of US atmospheric nuke tests in 62. So a plan called Starfish Prime is formed. And the scientists at Starfish Prime, I'm not allowed to say exactly who they were and exactly what the, all the conversations were, but I can say that they settled on a 1.4 megaton hydrogen bomb as the test trigger. There was discussion of much larger H-bombs. We had in our arsenal at that time an order of magnitude stronger H-bomb and, 
and plans for even larger ones is pretty much how much deuterium do you want to feed this thing. And so it was really how much launch capability do you have to launch that much deuterium. So they, they settled on 1.4 megaton as a sufficiently small bomb, not to have any real bad effects, but big enough to stimulate effects that would produce some good scientific data. So how they came up with 1.4 megatons turns out to be the equivalent of eh, between one and two, sounds good. So that's the, that's the math that went into it. They decided that it would be really fun to launch this above Honolulu. And so at 250 miles above Honolulu on 9 July 1962, they launch a Thor missile with a 1.4 megaton thermonuclear device at the tip. And they announced this ahead of time. They let everyone in the area know that you might see a big flash. Do not be alarmed. It's not them. It's us. And so uh, I'll show you the, the news headlines that appeared at the time in Honolulu newspapers to let people know that they were about to see a really cool thing that they probably want to wake their kids up and stay up to see because they weren't going to see too many of these in their lifetime. So I like that. Good view, likely. <laughs> Yes, different times back then. So there's Johnson Atoll. This is the place from which the uh, missiles were going to be launched. This is Gilligan and the professor waiting for the data. Of course, you have you know, missiles already. You have uh, tracking stations for telemetry all lined up. More guys saying, yeah, I, I get paid for this. The Thor missile is being launched. It's heading off to the skies with payload. They're really hoping this thing doesn't uh, blow up on the launch pad because that would be a bad day. A lot of paperwork to fill out when a nuke blows up on the launch pad. And so it heads to the skies. It's followed by a bunch of chaser rockets that are going to uh, instrument things at various altitudes. And you won't be able to see very much except this flash, and it's over. And we see this from different cameras at different parts of the Pacific. And you see the different colors, the greens, the blues. The greens, oxygen. That's what oxygen looks like when you excite it with uh, high energy electrons. Uh, you'll see an afterglow of blue, that's nitrogen glowing. And this is visible from, again, hundreds of miles away. There are beautiful auroral displays which are not captured in the limited dynamic range of this film, uh, which was, uh, in fact, classified until just a few years ago. And these are purposefully degraded images because the uh, high resolution ones are still classified. And so uh, that's what we decided to do. We thought it would be kind of a fun deal. You know, basically it was, um, I, I, I'm sorry to say it really was about as casual as, let's just see what happens because it'll be neat. And um, the magnitude of the disruption actually frightened the scientists who designed this because they thought 1.4 megatons was going to be small. And the uh, <clears throat> events that unfolded were things that were actually kind of out of their control. And they were really kind of taken aback by what happened. First of all, they wanted to measure EMP. They had an estimate of what the EMP magnitudes were going to be. So they had instrumentation designed to cover that range and a factor of 10 or 100. Their instruments saturated. The EMP fields were that much stronger. They were three orders of magnitude stronger than their worst case estimate. Oops. Um, microwave links were wiped out. They actually fried vacuum tube powered microwave receivers. And so uh, Kauai lost its telephone service to the other islands because they lost their microwave link, which was the only way they got from island to island back then. Burglar alarms, traffic lights, garage door openers all misbehaved uh, from the EMP. Traffic lights, this is not you know, a picojoule operated kind of thing. This is you know, joules. And it's being affected by a blast hundreds of miles above the Earth. So I I'm glad they didn't go with a 10 megaton option because you know, really, really extremely bad things would have happened. I mean, this was bad enough. These were not anticipated effects. So, uh, and the unanticipated effects went even further. So Telstar, the world's first active communication satellite. It was a remarkable achievement for the age. It was the brainchild of largely one guy, John Pierce, at Bell Labs, who had previously done Echo, which was just a metallized Mylar balloon, which just bounced signals from the Earth back down. And uh, this one actually had transistors and stuff in it. So it was pretty cool. It was the first big test of this kind of technology. It was so exciting to people at the time. It's hard for us to imagine now where we're jaded by the regularity of miracles. But at that time, this is the first time you could actually see a broadcast from France in real time. They had Jacques Brel singing uh, from, from his uh, studio in Paris. We had uh, folks in the UK giving us news broadcast uh, in real time. And we, we did the same thing to them. This was an amazing event. The world felt more connected. And in the backdrop of the Cold War, this kind of gave people some optimism that maybe we weren't doomed to extinction by our folly. 
a, a group called the Tornadoes, a British rock group, uh, actually was the first British invading uh, rock group. They, they beat the Beatles uh, with a number one hit called Telstar. And I can't imagine today a song called iPod, uh, you know, making the top 40, but this one, you know, was on the hit charts for a long time. So there you go. It just kind of gives you an idea of just what an impact this had culturally. Well, within weeks, Telstar starts to act funny, and ground stations are scrambling to try to figure out how to use backup circuits and do clever algorithmic things to keep the bird useful. Uh, but by February, it's just completely dead. They've pulled all the rabbits out of their hat. There are no more rabbits, just rabbit poop. And so Telstar goes silent. And as it turns out, so are one-third of all the other low-Earth orbiting satellites that had been launched and were in orbit there. So the Brits, the Soviets, the French, everyone was pissed off at us because they figured out we had something to do with it with that, that blast. And indeed, what had happened was this. Uh, we had actually created a new Van Allen belt, or we had extended the Van Allen belt. And so that was you know, part of the goal, was they wanted to modulate the Van Allen belt. Well, mission accomplished, except they realized that they didn't have quite the uh, specificity of control <laughs> that you would like a weapon to have. You don't want your weapon to kill your assets, and that's exactly what happened. The relativistic electrons proved absolutely lethal to satellite electronics. The transistor's betas went from 100 to 30, to 10, to 0.1. And transistors don't transist very well with betas of 0.1. So yes, yeah, Starfish Prime did successfully prove that you could turn the Van Allen belt into an effective weapon, but the message was, uh, but you don't want to do that. And so it was failures like that that actually form a backdrop with negotiations that had been going on for years about the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. So we decided that there was no real good purpose uh, in exploding H-bombs <laughs> in the atmosphere. So we decided that we would probably uh, go along with the test ban treaty, and the Soviets agreed as well. So finally, in late 1963, uh, we stopped this nonsense, and we haven't resumed it uh, in the last 50 years, thank goodness. So that research stops. Now, there's a postscript to this story of Telstar. Uh, John Pierce finished off his career as a music professor, of all things, at Stanford University. And I was privileged to have a few meals with him before he passed away. And he opened up and talked about his long storied career and the various things that he did. And uh, I had not known this, but he was actually partly responsible for the creation of DARPA, an organization that I later served in. And he said that he was very proud of one contribution he made, because he was on the, an advisory panel for Eisenhower and had lots of other people. But he insisted that DARPA be located not in the Pentagon. Because if the goal of DARPA was to be not like the Pentagon, you don't want them in the Pentagon, because eventually the DNA of the Pentagon would infect the DARPA people, and they would just be indistinguishable from all the other Pentagon folks. And so uh, eventually that recommendation was followed. Now, the irony is that DARPA was intimately involved in Starfish Prime, the thing that killed his satellite. So he said, you know, with somewhat re some regret, he says, you know, I, I created, helped create the organization that killed off you know, one of the proudest things I ever did, which was Telstar. So, sorry, John, um, you know, our bad. But sometimes stuff happens. So we will try to learn that lesson from that lesson and, uh, and not repeat this. Now, we don't need H-bombs to create disaster effects. I mean, the Carrington event already hints that the sun can do things that could possibly wipe out our infrastructure that we've built up with so much aggregate expense over such a long period of time. The sun can do just fine, thank you very much, without H-bombs. In March of 1989, we observed the sun belching an equivalent of about 40 Earths of mass being ejected from the sun and traveling at us uh, at about a 2 million kilometer per hour clip. So it gets here in about two days. So we had advance warning. The astronomer said, hey, there's this belching, and guess what? It happened from the side of the sun, and it's in a direction, so our orbit is going to cross uh, that matter in a couple of days. And it looks like the northeast is going to get whacked good and hard. We don't know what's going to happen, but look out. Thank you very much. We're about to hit a car crash, but you know, there's nothing we can do, but just be careful. So you'll know you're going to die, but there's not much you can do. So as it hits, again, it stimulates incredibly beautiful auroras. Uh, they're visible in Cuba. Just imagine what it takes to make auroras extend from the North Pole down to Cuba. That's pretty amazing. Well, aside from the pretty displays, it kills off uh, Quebec's uh, power grid 
in 90 seconds, from the first detection of matter hitting the Earth to darkness all throughout Montreal. It's 90 seconds. That's all it took. And it turns out that Quebec has an interesting ge geology, which made it particularly prone, but all of us are not immune either. Uh, their subsurface geology consists of relatively non-conductive rock, which is really good for stable buildings, but it's bad if you want to induce currents. You're going to have a tough time inducing currents. So it turns out that you know, currents will be induced somewhere. And so if not in the ground, guess what? The nearest metal turns out to be the 734 kilovolt transmission lines <laughs> that fed the Quebec region. And so all of a sudden, there were huge mystery currents flowing in these wires at frequencies that were not 60 cycles per second. It caused transformer cores to saturate. Huge harmonic currents are then set up. Uh, that caused various breakers and protective circuits to trip. But it's not designed to absorb, because I mean, the energy is still resident in the transmission line. It has to go somewhere. So if you're disconnecting this part of the line, you just now loaded that energy into your neighbor. And so within 90 seconds, you had a cascading failure that basically wiped out that entire region. And it was only by luck it didn't take out the northeast of the United States. It was sort of one breaker away from wiping out the northeast of the United States. So that was just luck. If the CME had just been a little stronger, we would have gone dark as well. Um, so this is sort of the physics part of it. You've got this big current flowing this way. It induces currents somewhere underneath it. And of course, this metal is what happened in the case of Quebec. So bad day for Quebec. Uh, it took them um, billions of dollars to pay for the damage that had occurred in 90 seconds. It took them nine hours to get back to 80% of the population being powered back up. This is in the middle of winter, so they worked day and night to, to make this happen. They worked really hard. The crews were heroes there. Uh, but uh, you know, the fact that it cost billions of dollars should give us pause. This is a relatively small localized event, and billions of dollars were, uh, were damaged. So that's something we should think about. So you know, 1989 was relatively recent. I mean, I remember 1989, sort of. And, uh, but that was many Moore's Law generations ago. And so today's technology is far more ubiquitous and it's far more fragile than a 730 kilovolt transmission line. Uh, CMEs happen all the time. Basically every solar cycle, there's a number of CMEs. It's just that we're lucky that we're 93 million miles away and the CMEs generally don't happen to whack us head on. It goes to some other part of the orbit. So the probability of us getting hit is thankfully relatively small, but it's non-zero as we've seen. We've had historic events that show us the danger. So right now our strategy has been collectively as a profession and as a species to be lucky. That's our strategy. It's the ostrich method, which is not a particularly effective method in the long run, I am told. So uh, counting on luck for the indefinite future is probably a bit dodgy. Uh, in fact, Lloyd's of London has gotten into the act. Even they are now getting concerned about this because they notice that we are dependent on technology to a degree that is unprecedented. And that trend is only going to intensify. And so they commissioned a study and their actuarial tables now reflect what they consider to be a uh, calibrated risk of perhaps a trillion dollars of damage being done by the next sort of Carrington level event, which they deem to be something that's possible once a century. So that's sort of how they've sussed it out, a trillion dollars. I don't really have a good feel for what a trillion dollars is. All I know is that it's a lot uh, because it's similar to the uh, national debt. And so I know that's a big number. So if in one event we suddenly add a trillion dollars worth of debt, that's a big economic hit, the global consequences of which we aren't even capable of modeling properly, I'm sure. But beyond that, just think of the human misery that'll be caused. How long will it take to replace a trillion dollars worth of damaged infrastructure? Um, what happens if all the GPS satellites suddenly go on the blink? What happens if the internet shuts down? Uh, that's something that's horrifying to contemplate. We'll be thrown back to the 1950s or 1960s, perhaps, if a Carrington level event occurs and we haven't done anything to sort of uh, strengthen our, our defenses against it. So we need a real strategy, and I'm delighted that I was asked to talk to this group because you are the folks with the skill set and the wisdom to think about a strategy and perhaps advise people who have the authority to sort of mandate perhaps uh, standards for future devices to sort of think about this to the first order as opposed to having just be in the back of their minds. 
I'm particularly obsessed with uh, this Internet of Things craze that we've been hearing so much about recently where there are these nutty people talking seriously about a trillion devices being connected to the Internet within 20 years. The vision of most of these people are that these devices would be small, cheap, light. I mean, that gener generally means unprotected. You know, we worry about network security just sort of from a software and hacking uh, attack surface point of view, but there's also an attack surface exposure uh, to these coronal mass ejections from the sun. So I worry about all these things. <clears throat> I'm basically wired to be pathologically optimistic, but I'm also an engineering professor, which means I have to worry about things that can go wrong. And these are the things that keep me up at night. I wake up every once in a while and think about the sun belching out, you know, 100 Earths, and they happen to hit a smack dab in the middle of where we got a lot of infrastructure, and then bad stuff happens. How are we going to rebootstrap all of civilization if we've become dependent on this resource and it suddenly is taken away uh, overnight? That's a scenario that uh, is difficult for us to comprehend. So not to be alarmist, but these are possibilities, not necessarily probabilities, but they're possibilities. And the best thing to make these probabilities small is just to get some awareness about this. So that's my, my final message. And so I'll just close by saying that uh, 2022 is a year to watch out for. That's the next solar maximum in the cycle. And so, you know, watch the skies. Get ready. We'll see what happens. Hopefully it won't be a, a violent storm, but we just don't know yet. We don't have models that are sufficiently precise to tell, but we just know that roughly 22, 2022 is when something could happen. Thank you very much for listening. Well, we have a technical committee, number five, that's high power electromagnetics. I suspect that after hearing this talk, <laughs> their meetings this week will be very, very full. Because <laughs> I know I'm scared to death at this point. <laughs> I'm going to throw away all my wireless devices, maybe. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Lee, very much. This is very interesting, very informative. I'd like to give you a little thank you for oh, it, for well, coming. Thank you. And I can't thank you enough for, for your talk. It was great. Well, thank you. So enjoy the rest of the conference. and and. Uh, <clears throat> be thinking about this message. I think it's really important. So thank you again. Thank you.